So I've literally consumed thousands of pounds of raw meat, fish, and organs on a carnivore diet over the past six years. I'm going to share with you guys the understanding that has allowed me to avoid any of the negatives associated with consuming raw animal foods. Now, why consume raw in the first place? It does digest better and certain nutrients are more available to the body. I will touch on that in a separate video, but B vitamin content can be compromised by up to 50% by cooking to well done. Vitamin C can be lost entirely and fat soluble vitamins vary between 10 to 20% in the amount lost. Overarching preventative measures for bacteria, parasites, anything negative that can occur in animal foods are sourcing a high quality so that the bacteria strain is not unnatural and it is in lower amounts, searing the outside of the meat as bacteria occurs on the outside of the meat, and always adjusting your body to foods. Make sure that you don't eat two pounds of raw liver when you've never had it before. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So how does meat get contaminated in the first place? In the case of cattle, for instance, when we feed cows grain, it increases the acidity of their stomach. What this does is allow E. coli to become acid resistant, whereas the strain of E. coli in grass-fed cattle is not harmful to the human digestive system. This new acid resistant strain can cause problems in humans. And although, you know, some people I know do consume raw conventional meat from the supermarket and their bodies have adjusted to these unnatural strains of bacteria, most people are not adjusted to them. Uh, so from the feed, the antibiotics, how the animal is kept, all of those things can create unnatural strains of bacteria or just increase the amount of bacteria substantially. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that this bacteria occurs in the digestive tract of the animal. So any issues regarding contamination were a result of direct contact with fecal matter at some point, whether it's plants having manure being used as fertilizer or the intestines being ground up with the meat grind. Another way that the meat can get contaminated is during the slaughtering process. Maybe they punctured the intestines while slaughtering. Maybe the facility wasn't cleaned properly beforehand. Maybe they cut up some chicken on a cutting board and then did beef. Who knows what they did. Raw milk is susceptible to a lot of the things that meat is, but it's also susceptible to waterborne illnesses as the nature of it, you know, raw milk is a liquid. So let's jump right into the two most popular bacteria, Salmonella and E. coli. And these bacteria do occur in the human digestive tract. What makes them harmful, as I said earlier, is the unnatural strains created by factory farming, conventional feedlots, the unnatural conditions that we raise our animals in. Seeing as the bacteria occurs in the digestive tract, you know, it's on the outside of the eggshell. It's on the outside of the meat. It won't be directly in the product unless like it's ground beef. Uh, in that case, you would have to either cook it very thoroughly or perhaps grind meat up yourself. Uh, the solution to this is to get pasture raised alternatives. So those pasture raised animals will have less bacteria, more natural strains, and you won't have to worry about getting sick. Uh, in regards to the recent recalls, I mean, there was one for salmonella in ground beef, that was an incredible amount. Uh, the romaine recalls, I'm not sure if anywhere in the United States is carrying romaine lettuce now. And there have been quite a few recalls, especially in regards to plant foods over the past year or two in regards to salmonella and E. coli. But the thing we have to keep in mind here is these are all from the conventional feedlot operations. Creating these unnatural strains of bacteria by the poor conditions that these animals are living in is what is getting us sick not naturally raised animals. The idea that you can get sick from consuming, you know, high quality meat is not present. It's what a lot of people believe because yeah, I mean, there's a huge difference between consuming grain fed chicken from the supermarket and wild elk meat. It wouldn't even be fair to consider those both meat in that context. Brucella, Campylobacter, Listeria, and Crypto are all waterborne illnesses, cross-contamination. They can be found in raw milk, but they're not specific to raw milk. Uh, raw milk can also have salmonella and E. coli. And with raw milk, you really just have to make sure that the producer is using a clean facility and that you trust them. That's 
really all you can do for raw milk. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to raw milk. It has a higher vitamin content. It has more beneficial bacteria. I won't go too much into that. Uh, I do have a video on dairy that I did a few months ago. Vibriosis is a bacteria that occurs in oysters in the warmer weather. Uh, you can just buy oysters from cold water in the warmer months or try to be very careful with your sourcing of uh, oysters during that period of time. Parasites. Most people are familiar with trichinosis in pork, but in the United States, it's been pretty much eradicated in pork. Uh, the primary concern right now is wild boar and bear meat as these omnivorous animals still have contact with rodents as they are foragers. Uh, you can heat the meat to 165 degrees. Uh, you can't kill them by freezing them. There is no cure for trichinosis. Uh, once it's in the digestive tract and it burrows through the intestine, it will lay eggs and larvae in the muscle tissue and you can take an antibiotic and destroy the larvae in the intestine, but uh, Steve Rinella, who was on the Joe Rogan podcast, he's a very popular hunter, he got trichinosis from eating undercooked bear meat. So definitely check that out if you're interested in that, but 95% plus of the cases recently have been from wild game meat. Anisochiasis and Diphilobothrium latum are the two parasitic worms that occur in fish primarily. Uh, the first one, nematodes and roundworms, occur in ocean fish. So these are the most common ones because these tapeworms occur in freshwater fish. And the difference visually is these are, there's no segments on these worms and they're very translucent and kind of hard to see. These are also translucent, but they're segmented. And as they only occur in freshwater fish, there are much fewer people that get contaminated by them. Uh, the big difference here is these cannot take hold in the human digestive tract. The nematodes, the more common roundworms, are generally not harmful to humans, whereas the segmented tapeworms can take hold in the digestive tract and can cause issues. They shouldn't get past the fishmonger, and you have to be careful when filleting fish to try to notice if the animal has worms or larva or anything in it, particularly around the stomach area, around the tail, in the egg sacs. If you freeze the fish at negative 35 degrees for 24 hours, they will die. If you heat the fish up to 145 degrees, they will also die. Unfortunately, most people don't have a freezer that gets that cold, and cooking fish to 145 degrees ruins the fish. So uh, again, as with a lot of this bacteria, a lot of these things, the animal was raised in ideal conditions and the butcher keeps an eye out for things like parasites, flukes, and things like that. It shouldn't necessarily get to the retail shelf. Now, in whole fish, the nematodes and the roundworms are pretty hard to see, so you will likely run into these. And if you've ever filleted a salmon before, it would be unusual for it not to have nematodes. A uh, very naturally occurring thing in fish. Liver flukes infect the liver, gallbladder, and bile duct of animals. Uh, the first two are not really a concern in the United States. They occur in seafood in Asia and Europe. Uh, fasciola, which is known as the sheep liver fluke, is on all the continents. Uh, I have never seen this before in the hundreds of pounds of liver I've consumed. So whoever started the myth that you need to freeze ruminant liver uh, is, is out of their mind because no butcher will let an animal that has a liver fluke infestation get to retail. 100% it will never happen. Uh, so if any of you guys have actually come across liver flukes in the United States, please let me know. I would be very surprised. Uh, red tide is caused by an algae bloom when storms bring up the nutrients from the ocean floor. Uh, they usually have recalls on seafood and if you're actually at the beach when that happens, uh, you can get very sick. So uh, that's definitely a, a much larger issue than just like cross-contamination or uh, you know some sort of parasite. Prions, and if one more person tells me I'm gonna get mad cow disease from eating lamb brains, I might actually lose my mind. Because if the animal has a prion disease, it is in all tissues of the animal. It is more concentrated in the central nervous system, but it's in every tissue in the animal. And a lot of people that did get mad cow disease, you know, they weren't exactly eating beef brain. They were just eating other parts of the animal. Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease is the variant that manifests in humans either genetically or contact with infected human brain tissue. I don't know, maybe you're a brain surgeon, a first responder, a cannibal, I don't know. Bovine sponge form encephalopathy, BSC, is mad cow disease. It originated when they fed scrappy infected sheep and goat, scrappy being the form 
of prion disease in sheep and goats. They fed that to the cattle. It developed a mutated form of the disease, which we know now is mad cow disease, which was now transmissible to humans. But there are actually no cases from United States cattle because it takes three years for the disease to manifest in an animal. And all U.S. cattle is slaughtered younger than three years of age. So any diagnosis in the United States, maybe they ate beef from Canada or Europe or another country. Uh, chronic wasting disease is the version that occurs in deer, elk, reindeer, and moose. Uh, it has been shown to be transferable to non-human primates, but they've never proven that humans can get it. Uh, Joe Rogan experienced number 1154, Doug Dern and Brian Richards. Uh, one of the guys is an expert on chronic wasting disease. Definitely some interesting stuff if you want to learn more about that. Scrappy is the form that occurs in sheep and goats. Discovered since 1732. It's not transferable to humans. Pork is not on here because they're immune to the prion disease. Uh, pretty interesting. You know, so we could sit here and try to theorize, all right, are these bacterial strains natural? Are these parasites naturally occurring? But at the end of the day, we just need to know what precautions we have to take. So, you know, buy high quality animal foods, sear the outside of the meat, especially if it's from the supermarket and, you know, try to avoid ground beef uh, from the supermarket and, and maybe grind the meat yourself. Uh, for these things, obviously there's some precautions you have to take with raw milk, vibriosis, we went over that. Uh, the parasites, you know, don't eat wild boar and bear meat. I mean, it's that simple. Uh, the worms, either trust your fishmonger or make sure to go through the fish yourself when you're filleting it. Uh, for the liver flukes, uh, I don't know if they're a myth, you know, I'm, I'm joking, but the liver flukes, I wouldn't even worry about them. I didn't want to put them on here, to be honest, but uh, someone would have probably brought them up. The red tie thing is usually brought up uh, in the news for recalls and for prion diseases, you know, don't go around eating human brain tissue or cow brain tissue is all I really have to say. Uh, you know, it's pretty safe to eat pork brain, it's safe to eat lamb brain, it's safe to eat calves brain as the animals are younger. So, although I said I, I've never been sick before in my six years, uh, one time I shucked some oysters, I froze them, and after eating the frozen oysters, I had some really bad stomach pain. So, definitely make sure to adhere to basic food safety rules. Um, you know, I do work in New York City restaurants, I do have a food handler certification, so I am familiar with cooking temperatures, I am familiar with food safety. Uh, I probably do take a lot of these things for granted as a lot of the handling of food that I do is kind of innately built into my restaurant experience. If you guys do have any questions about this, please, you know, just let me know in the comments. If you guys would like to support the channel, please subscribe, share the video. Uh, I am doing exclusive videos for Patreon now if you guys want to check that out. I do have an Amazon shop where I just have some products that I use in my day-to-day -day life. I am on Twitter. I am on Instagram. Uh, if you guys are on social media, I would love it if you followed me. Uh, if you do want to reach out to me for one-on-one -on -one consultations, in this case, maybe about transitioning to a raw meat diet, you can contact me through the website in the description below or email me frankatofano at gmail.com. Um, all this information is on a carnivore wiki that I am working on. Uh, if you guys want to sign up, if you guys want to contribute information, uh, maybe you want to be an admin, let me know. Uh, I'll also talk about that on the live stream later. So uh, again, thank you guys for watching. And, um...